Yes, amen to that. For sure. Mm. We, we want to be a channel of peace, don't we? Well, good morning. This morning, before we begin, begin, I'll remind you a little bit of what Austin preached last Sunday as far as the message that um, he read from Luke before this. The women had gone to anoint Jesus' body, if you remember, and they find the tomb empty. And two men appear in dazzling robes to ask them why they're seeking the living among the dead. For Jesus was risen. He was alive. Well, these women now go back and tell the apostles that Jesus is not there. And the men are skeptical. You kind of made that clear last week. Yes, they were skeptical. The women were not good witnesses. In the message that Eugene Peterson has given us of the word, he says this. He said, they kept telling these things to the apostles, but the apostles didn't believe a word of it. They thought they were making it up. But Peter jumped to his feet and ran to the tomb. He walked away, puzzled, shaking his head. And that's where we left off last week. And we'll start with Luke. We're still in chapter 24 with verse 13. And your bulletin says 25, but it's 35. Oh, I don't know how that ended up, but it is that much. But here we are. And before, well, no, I'm going to mention that in a minute. Yes, okay. <laughs> all right. Now that's that same day. All right, just realize this is the same day after Peter has run to the tomb. At that same day, two of them, which I'm assuming were one of the apostles, some of the apostles in the room, some of them, two of them, (laughs) were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still. They stopped, their faces down. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and you do not know the things that have happened here in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since this took place. And in addition, some of the women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it's true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. A man, I might add. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Let's pray together. Lord, as we hear your word, may we wonder. Wonder and seek and hear what you have to say for us. 
And Lord, may it be your word that is spoken. May your spirit speak today as we look at this passage at Jesus appearing after his death. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Luke is the only gospel writer to mention this road to Emmaus. Now, my parents had this picture in the last house we lived in. I asked my sister this morning if we, had, if we remember it in any other house, and I don't. But they were, my mother was there for over 20 years. And this painting is called The Road to Emmaus. If you've never seen it, this is a fairly well-known painting. You can look it up and you can find it. Of course, this is... A replica upon replica. <laughs> it is not the painting, okay? Um, it, it has a lot of age on it, too. But <clears throat> Jesus is in the middle, and these apostles, these men who were with the apostles in the room when the, the ladies came, are walking on this road. And I kind of looked it up. It's showing kind of a city off away, and it is showing it down. And I was thinking, they're going down from Jerusalem, and they're going to have to come back up. I just want, it's going to be a hike. So, I look at it now and I think about their walking, where they're walking and why. I don't know about you, but I'm wondering why. why. Why are they walking to Emmaus? They just heard Jesus was not in the tomb. I, I'm just baffled by that. So, I think they must be struggling a little bit here. And it, it makes me think of us all on a journey, and I'll get to that in a minute. We're all walking somewhere. So there's a mystery here in this, in this picture. Yet Jesus is in their midst. Where two or more are gathered, he's there. Just keep that in mind. We may not always recognize him, but he's there. And he wants us to learn. He wants us to grow. He wants us to listen and learn. And he shows up. And when he shows up, life can change. And that's really kind of the basis we've got for this story today. So looking back at the passage, let's see what God may have for us here. I'm looking and I say, I want to wonder about it. Why are these apostles leaving? Where are they going? When did they decide to leave? They didn't have a whole lot of time, but they're getting there towards the end of the day and they're going about seven or eight miles. And I don't see them rushing. I see them talking and discussing. And they've just heard the tomb is empty. We just celebrated that last week, an empty tomb, but they don't have the same perspective we do. Nobody that they believe has seen Jesus yet. So they've turned away from the good news, and they're headed somewhere else. Was it home, family? Again, we don't know, but they left their hope in Jerusalem. He was who they had hoped was the one that he was the one to come and redeem Israel, that he would be the Messiah. But you see, they say it in the last, the, the past tense. They had hoped. And that is when Jesus himself appears beside them and walks with them and talks with them. Jesus knows what they're discussing, but he still asks, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stop. What? What? You don't know what's going on? How could you be in Jerusalem and not know? I mean, imagine if you were in downtown Griffin the day after the World Series and somebody didn't know that Atlanta won the World Series. I mean, you kind of feel, it's like, what? How could you not know this? I mean, it's that kind of news, like, oh, my goodness. I mean, there's no good analogy, really, for this because these guys didn't have cell phones where they could text everybody or send it on Twitter or Facebook. It's all there for everybody to see. There are no instant messages popping up to tell you this news. But they expected in Jerusalem he should have known. And they didn't have fact check either. Just say it. But obviously if you had been in Jerusalem during the week of the Passover, you should know what is going on. I mean, how big a deal when this man comes in on a donkey and people are saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're shouting. They're making this great big to-do about Jesus. And then a week later, they arrest him. They whip him. They try him. They kill him. He died on a cross he was crucified, and that's what they remember, and that's what they see. 
Jesus was dead and buried. And their description of who Jesus is, when they tell him, they say he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people, seems to tell me they're struggling a little bit with the belief that he's still the one. Is he the one? They, they're not sure. In fact, since they're walking away, I'm kind of thinking they've given up. They don't mention Messiah to him, just the hope that they had had. And they even tell the stranger about the amazing story the women had told. I wonder how they told that. You know, the women came and told us this strange thing about angels coming. They didn't know what to make of it all, but leaving Jerusalem tells me they can't believe Jesus is alive. It's just been too much. Now, the part of the story that really interests me comes next, and I like how the message says this too. How thick-headed you are. Slow-hearted. Now, don't you wish you could have heard what Jesus said at that point, what he taught from Moses to the prophets, that he gives them a scripture lesson on why the Messiah had to suffer and die before he went to his glory? Makes me wonder, did he start with Moses and the Passover, how a lamb had to be sacrificed in each household and blood had to be put on the doorpost so they could live? Did he go on to explain the meaning of the tabernacle and why they had the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant, all the sacrifices that had to be made, that blood had to be shed, whether it was the bull, the ram, the lamb, the goat? I mean, they sacrificed a lot of animals. They shed a lot of blood because blood had to be shed. Leviticus 17.11 says, For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. What did Jesus tell them? After just doing Samuel, I even wonder if he brought up David and all the Psalms that David wrote that mention the anointed one, and he's not really referring to himself. And did he talk about the covenant that God made with David? There's so many so many things that he could have said. And then he could have gone to the prophets like Isaiah and read Isaiah 53, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's verse 5. And then verse 10 says, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. I would love to know the scriptures Jesus used that day as he spoke to them on the road as they're going to Emmaus. And they still don't recognize him. And scripture makes it pretty clear. It's a supernatural act that they didn't know who he was. So as they stop... Jesus acts as if he's going to keep going, and they're like, no, stay with us. Now, I want to think, oh, if I was in the presence of Jesus, wouldn't I want him to stay? Yes, stay. Teach us some more. Sit with us as we eat. So they start their meal together. Just remember, they have invited him in, yet Jesus takes the bread, is what a host does, and he takes the bread, he gives thanks, and he breaks it. This is the moment. This is the moment of familiarity. It is also the moment when Jesus opens their eyes and they see him. But they just get a glimpse because then what happens? He just disappears. Okay, when you start talking about the resurrection and what you believe, okay, you're going to believe he just disappeared? There's a lot about Jesus. We've got to think about what it is we believe. And this is life-changing. Jesus has appeared to them, and so now what happens? They turn around, and they go back. They head back to the fellowship. They head back to the 11 and the other followers. It was nearly evening, and I I have to stop and ponder. This is something we don't know either. When they arrived, how long it took. We know it was about seven to eight miles. But I bet they went a lot faster, and I bet they were a lot more out of breath when they're heading up to Jerusalem, and they were probably really out of breath by the time they got there. And when they get there, everyone's awake. 
So is it early morning, late at night? But they are excited because Simon has seen Jesus, and now they believe. And so now it's their turn to tell their story of how Jesus appeared to them. Great story. But what does it mean for us? What do we need to know from this passage? First of all, I don't think Thomas was the first doubter. These guys were doubting. I think that they were struggling with their faith. Why else would they leave the disciples with such good news? or even confusing news, wouldn't you want to know? So how do you deal, how do I deal with amazing, too good to believe news? Sometimes it's just too good to be true. And like these men, we have our doubts. I don't know about you, but I do. We have our uncertainties, things we're not sure about. It could be our faith about who Jesus is or did he really walk out of that tomb? I mean, have you ever seen anybody come back to life who's been dead and buried for three days? How do you respond when someone tells you they've been healed? Are you one of those that believes what they say, or do you kind of go, mm, I don't know, can we check with the doctor and let's see about that? I mean, I can be a skeptic. I just confess it. I, it's, it's a hard thing, and I go through those times, I mean, when I'm just like, I'm not so sure. I mean, we may not immediately believe. We may need to be like these men who walked away. And what happens then for us? Sometimes it's difficult to believe what we cannot see. Just admit it. I mean, it certainly is. It's hard. I mean, I don't know how a plane gets in the air, but, you know, I mean, it's just, <laughs> I still get on one. We talk about those things about faith, like sitting in that pew. It could fall. They've been here a while. But, you know, we trust that it's going to hold you up. But do you keep these doubts to yourself, or do you find someone that you can discuss them with? I think it's very interesting. It's not just one man walking along the road. It's two. And they're discussing, and they're trying to figure this out. They're seeking to find the truth. They want to know the truth. They want to, they're upset. They, they feel like their hopes have been crushed. So I ask you, do you have someone that you can talk with? Do you have someone you can share with? Do you have someone you can ask those hard questions, those questions about what we believe? Do we really believe it? Do we understand it? No. Can we believe it in faith? It's good to have someone else who can talk about those things and discuss them with you, who can pray with you, who spends time with you and helps you work through these problems and things. And these two were discussing them and, how good and how sweet is it that Jesus comes and walks with them in the midst of that. And that's what I think he does for us too. He will find us on the road. He will enter into our discussions and our questions. I'm sure that there have been many times that he has wanted to call me thick-headed, slow to catch on, slow of heart slow to pick up his word and seek the answers that he's already given because, I mean, what could more could we ask for? I mean, what a treasure we have. God's word has been given to us. Not just God so loved the world. There are so many wonderful verses, and I find it wonderful that he goes to the Old Testament. <laughs> if you know, I mean, that is... I love the Old Testament, always have. If you've known me long enough, you know that. Because these are the scriptures that Jesus read. It's, it's the scripture that he fulfilled. All scripture leads to the same place. The Messiah will suffer, and he will enter into his glory. And we also know that blood had to be shed. A perfect sacrifice. I mean, we, we would have to go back in time to understand the trouble they went to to have a perfect lamb <laughs> that they had to choose from among all the sheep and find that perfect lamb to be sacrificed. We don't have to know all the answers. We don't have to know all of these words in Scripture in order to, for God to save us. But God himself is showing how important it is that you understand. It's so much easier if you understand a little more. So God speaks to us in his word. Jesus is the word. And he gives us 
these scriptures to encourage us so that we can read them, we can see the promises that are fulfilled, the covenants that are made, how God keeps his covenants. We don't do so much. And even when we don't, he always keeps his covenant. Wherever we are on our walk, in our relationship with Christ, in our walk with Jesus, wherever we are in that walk, God joins us there. He longs to tell us about himself and his word. Mark Buchanan has a book called God Walk. It's, it's a cool book, and it, he says this about it. He says, Scripture gives direction. It makes ancient ways new. The Holy Spirit gives guidance. He makes the ancient ways personal. It's a potent combination. Walk this way. It's a good book. It's, kind of a, it's, it's got some interesting things in it about how we walk and how we sometimes just need to slow down and walk and listen. But know that sometimes when we least expect it, whether it's some breaking of the bread, having a, or sharing a cup of coffee or tea with a friend, God may just open your eyes and he lets you catch a glimpse of himself in the ordinary events of life. Particularly when we're seeking, I think more often when we're looking, we might be more often, but sometimes he just comes alongside when you don't expect it. He shows up. Maybe when we're walking and talking, maybe when we're sitting in silence, listening for his voice, the Holy Spirit is present to open our eyes, to give us a glimpse, and maybe just a glimpse, and then he's gone, at least for us. But remember the times he shows up. It's almost like you have to have that signpost. You talked about some of those last week, but I think, you know, just a time when you remember. Like I say, it could be sharing a meal with friends or even with a stranger. It may be while visiting a shut-in. It may be shoveling concrete on a mission trip, changing a diaper, watching a sunset, waiting on a sunrise, serving with the least of these, these being at the pantry, playing the organ or the piano, singing. There's so many ways that Jesus shows up. God just shows up. And we need to be aware and listening when he does. If you think back, try to remember a time. I was trying to, to think of times. There, there are several. And then even in some that remind you particularly of something else. But I was thinking about my dad. And I'll try to say this. It's going to be really hard with my sister here. But she knows exactly what I'm talking about. Dad had a gesture that he would put his hand around your face. I mean, he would just kind of cup your face. And he would do it with us. He would do it with grandchildren. And even when he had Alzheimer's, that was still something that sort of remained. And I can remember when we had him in the nursing home, and he went up to a lady who was sitting in a wheelchair, and she really didn't know that he was there or that anybody was there. She was pretty, you know, but I see my daddy reaching over and putting his hand on her cheek. And, I mean, that was kind of a God moment for me. I can say it was just something that you see clearly, and you know Jesus shows up. He's there. And I can also say that when my daddy died, in that same nursing home, and when I saw his body and I touched his hand, I knew he wasn't there. It was such a clear picture to me of the resurrection. My dad wasn't there. His body was there. My daddy wasn't. And I knew he was with Jesus. That was probably the, the it was just kind of a revelation to me all of a sudden. It just, poof. But those are good memories to have and to keep but it's easy to forget over time the clarity you have at that moment. And I've had periods of doubting when I wasn't sure I could believe Jesus was with me. Was he real at all? He seemed so far away that I didn't really feel like I could even pray. I've always, I mean, I've said before that I, I would suggest to anybody, if you can find someone you trust enough to be a prayer partner, someone you can meet with on a regular basis, it's so good to have someone to pray with you when you cannot. I think we all go through times. We just cannot pray. When the pain is too great, when you've lost a loved one or when something tragic has happened and, or, or you're just sick and we don't feel the presence of God, it helps to have a companion, to have someone who's willing to pray. A reminder that Jesus is walking with you. You know, 
we are sometimes the only Jesus people see. And when someone comes alongside you, I mean, they can be that hand of Christ to you. And it's important in those times. In Buchanan's book, again, he, he says again the importance of walking, that Jesus is with you. And he says, the walking is about us. It's our story. Jesus keeps doing this, becoming present with us, even as we lament absence, his absence. He keeps showing up, showing us things, walking beside us, making our hearts burn within us. He may not rec- we might not recognize him at that time. That often comes later. And it usually takes some walking to get there. End of quote. That's what the men said to one another. Were not our hearts burning? Have you had that moment? Have you had a time when your heart was just burning and you knew that Jesus was speaking that word to you? Or your heart's burning because he's not there. Jesus shows up even when we grieve his absence. And in this moment on the road to Emmaus, he teaches them about himself through familiar scriptures. He lets them have a glimpse of himself before he disappears, and he will do that for us. In John's gospel, Jesus says to the disciples after he appears to them, and I think this is always good for us to hear, because you have seen me, you have believed. See, we saw they were struggling. They couldn't believe. You have seen me, so you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. When we encounter Jesus, when we believe he is alive, something changes. Our direction changes. These disciples turned around, and they went back to a believing community, to the followers of Jesus. If we have had something, some pain, some problem, anything that has kept us from the community of believers, if we feel like we're too sinful, if we feel like we've done something too horrible, if we feel like life is just too hard and I don't want to deal with that with other people, let Jesus push you, turn you around, back to community. They go back and they share their story. And if you notice, they even say along the way, Because Jesus is the way. The early followers were called the way before they were called Christians. Jesus is the way. He gives us direction, and sometimes he just plain has to turn us around. We always we talk about repentance, that's what it is. It's an actual turning around, turning away from the sin you know you don't, you turn around. Go the opposite direction. And many of us can probably think of a time when we've changed directions. May not have been a good thing or could have been a bad, you know, but we can turn around. Something happened to change your direction. You may have been sorry or you may have been thanking God that he changed your direction. Death is often a cause for that change. And life, a new birth. Death and life can cause us to change direction. They can alter things in our life. Believing in Jesus and his death and his resurrection should be a direction changer for all of us. Central to this entire passage is the belief that Jesus did rise. He rose from the grave. He defeated death. That he paid the debt for our sins. That the Messiah had to suffer and die. That blood had to be shed. Do you believe that Jesus rose bodily from the grave? That his blood was shed for your sin? We share communion together once a month (laughs) to remind us that there is a risk of forgetting the real reason that we're eating and drinking the elements. It can sometimes be such a ritual that we do. We forget the real reason, the body and the blood of Jesus. God cannot stand in the presence of sin. 
We need the covering of his blood. Repentance is needed. A change of direction. Craig Barnes mentioned in a devotional this week in the midst of all this, and I kept thinking, I don't know if I want to put this in or not, but I think it really it comes down to this. Is maybe a question is not whether we believe in the resurrection, but whether we have encountered the risen Christ. That's the message. That's where we need to be. Have you encountered the risen Christ? The good news for us every day is that Jesus is risen. He wants us to encounter him, to meet with him, to learn from him, and he will show us the way. He is the way. And I believe that just as he led these apostles back to the disciples, he leads us to fellowship with other believers in worship and in service. Together we proclaim Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Let us walk in that belief. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we believe. Help our unbelief. Help us to be open to one another with our struggles and help us to trust that you are there with us every step of the way. And Lord, that you will lead us in the way we should go. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.